Welcome to Marketing Today. I'm your host, Alan Hart, managing partner of Atomic, combining brand science and creative fire. Today on the show, I've got Seth Kaufman, CMO of PepsiCo North America Beverages. Today we talk about Seth's top three priorities of portfolio, marketing, and talent transformation with Inside PepsiCo. Seth highlights the launch of a new product called Life Water and how that's in line with their planet, people, and products goals for 2025. We then transition over to talk about the Super Bowl halftime show with Lady Gaga and end up talking about his predictions for marketing's future, ranging from native advertising to experiential to blurring of fiction and reality. Well, Seth, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Excited to be here with you. I know you're the CMO of PepsiCo Beverages, but I've heard that your background is pretty interesting. Something about you starting at PepsiCo as an intern. Can you tell us a little bit about your path? Yeah, sure. So I'm incredibly fortunate in I've been at PepsiCo for a really, really long time and have done a lot of great jobs, experienced a lot of different things. So to your point, I started, uh, I started as an intern when I was in business school at Michigan, fell in love with the company, the people, the brands, the culture. So obviously then, you know, came back full time and came back and started in our marketplace initiatives development group, which is basically our consumer promotion group. This was before specific shopper marketing was a big thing. So we built these big national programs that got executed across the country and was fortunate enough at that point to work on our first Super Bowl program as NFL partners on the beverage side. And also, I think, as you know, power of one. And as we bundle foods and beverages, it's a really, really important thing for the company. That promotion was actually a power of one promotion. So from the very early days, I got to experience kind of the the strength, the scale, and the power of PepsiCo. Went from there to the brand side, did a bunch of brand and innovation stuff, which was great fun. And it was during that time that I got really interested in um, not just marketing as a whole, but broader general management. Went from that brand and innovation assignment actually to a different function and uh, did a sales strategy headquarters assignment where my team was accountable for building our channel strategies, right? What's our grocery strategy? What's our convenience and gas strategy and so on? And had a really, really good time and, and challenged doing that, learning a new part of the business, but didn't think it was enough of a stretch actually to get me out of my comfort zone. So I actually left headquarters went to the field, switched from the beverage side to the snack side, and ran a front line for us in Southeast Michigan, which was just the most unbelievable experience and incredibly humbling. And it's also a time when, um, you know, this is a job where you're leading, you know, 200, 250 frontline men and women, really the heroes that go to the stores every day, build our displays, put our products on the shelves. And it was at that point that I fell in love with the people side of the business even more than I already was. So was, I've always been a very passionate people leader. But, you know, coming in to a distribution center at, you know, five in the morning and seeing a 35-year veteran who's loading up their truck about to go to the store and seeing how, how they think of the company, how they think of their career, it really, really touched me in, in a profound way. And, you know, I think made me who I am today as far as being a people leader. So, did that for a couple of years, was fortunate enough to turn around the business with the help of an amazing team, and then came back to headquarters and ran our media group in beverages, which was a time when, you know, the media world was blowing up. You know, digital was like a thing and everyone was using like, hey, what's your digital strategy? What's your social strategy? And I always believed in an integrated strategy for the business that uses different touch points as a way to reach consumers. So Had a lot of fun over a couple of years rebuilding our capability in media, rebuilding our agency capability there, and did a lot of kind of industry first that that we were really proud of at the time. And then from there, got kind of what was my dream job, which was being the general manager for our Starbucks joint venture, true Mm. general manager job, running a joint venture, reporting to a board of directors, and, you know, had, had a great three years there where we turned it into a growth engine for both Starbucks and for PepsiCo. And because of that success, I was fortunate enough that the company asked me to come run the name on the door, Pepsi. Wow, what an experience (laughs) that was. It's an incredibly special brand um, with a lot of interested stakeholders internally and externally. And had uh, had a blast doing that, had, had some good success with the team doing that, and kind of increase the scope to include our flavored CSDs. And then ultimately, a little over a year ago, got, got this role, which, you know, I've had a lot of fun. It's a challenging role. I have a very clear and simple agenda. 
Actually, it's clear, it's not simple, because you know anything that's simple is probably not big enough. And the agenda is to literally accelerate our transformation journey across three dimensions. Portfolio transformation, making sure that we're offering enough choice for consumers as the, their needs continue to evolve and they look for more and more beverage choices in the marketplace. Two, marketing transformation. How do we evolve how we're engaging consumers in, in a world that obviously, as you know, is changing, you know, not just by the day, but by the hour as far as what technologies we can deploy, et cetera. And then third, and, and potentially most importantly, because without it, you can't do number one and two, is talent transformation. How do we bring the right people onto the team? How do we have diversity of skill set styles? How do we build a, a culture that is about experimentation and taking risk? And how do we build leadership capability, not just functional excellence? So that's my agenda right now, and been doing that for a little over a year. We're making great strides on it, and you know it affords me the opportunity to have a lot of fun while I'm doing it, too. Well, that's awesome. You don't know this about me, but actually one of my first jobs as a teenager was stocking Frito-Lay chips. No way. Yeah, yeah. So I love your, I love your story about going back out to the field and um, being close to those folks. So, it's a uh, hard job, isn't it? It is. It is. I will tell you, I did Pepsi as well, um, and that's a harder job just because of the weight. Yeah. <laughs> Beverages are heavier than yeah. than chips. Yes. That's yes. for sure. Yes. Yeah. That's hilarious. So yeah, early on. But now I'm now I'm a podcast host. So go figure. <laughs> um, I wanted to say one congrats on being named to the top fifty most innovative CMOs by Business Insider. I mean, that's oh, a, quite an accomplishment. Um, and actually, you were number 15 on their list. So not even in the top 50, you're the top 15. What does something like that mean to you? I mean, it's incredibly humbling. I'll start there. You know, I, again, I feel incredibly fortunate to have benefited from a, a lot of great stuff that the team has done over time. And I really believe that if you start from a, a talent and a people perspective, the results follow and lead to things like this recognition, right? It's my job to help the team set the vision and the strategy, to then break down the barriers and the obstacles that get in their way, but then really give them the room to operate, to take the risks that they need to take, to be okay with failing as long as we fail fast and learn from those mistakes, and to create a culture of folks that are connected enough to the business that they know what's right, but then are connected enough to culture and what's changing in the world to know what they need to push forward. You know, it means to me that the team is doing an incredible job bringing to life the things that I'm passionate about. And I just feel like the fortunate guy who happens to be sitting in the chair at the time that we're making some of these great strides that we're making on this transformation journey. So yeah, humbling experience. I obviously um, celebrated it, you know, with my team as much as thinking about it for myself. So now thinking about business, you talked about product transfer, product portfolio transformation. You know, taste and preferences, I know you know, are changing in the consumer landscape. How are you keeping up with, you know, with those changes in the product portfolio? And I've heard you're going to be launching a new water product as well, so yeah. I'm sure that fits into it. Yeah. You know, just think about the past, you know, two plus decades, and PepsiCo has really focused on expanding the choices of beverages that we have as consumer tastes change and evolve. And that's what is so incredibly special about this company. We have an incredible breadth in the portfolio of products that our consumers go to for different occasions, different needs that they have at different times of the day and for different lifestyles. And I'm really focused on continuing that transformation, continuing to expand the breadth of our choices as we go into the future, because it's not just about the past two plus decades, but it's about today and the next two decades. So we're really proud about being focused on offering products that meet the needs of evolving consumer tastes. And, you know, this year, 2016, or next year, 2017, depending upon which data you read, is the year that water actually will become bigger than carbonated soft drinks. So what that means is we have to be deploying more water products into the marketplace to meet those consumer needs. And, you know, you may or may not be familiar that PepsiCo just announced a, a, a new commitment to our performance with purpose goals, which is about planet, people, and products on the journey to 2025 and 2030. And the product part of that, which is what you asked about, we have some really, really bold ambitions. By 2025, two-thirds of our beverage products will have 
fewer than 100 calories per 12 ounce. And that's because that's where consumers are going. And we as PepsiCo have uh, a responsibility to bring consumers along on that journey and to offer them the choices that will, um, will engage with them, that they'll love, and they continue to buy our products. So, you know, we keep up with it by thinking about where consumer trends are going, by looking at headwinds and tailwinds in the marketplace, and then coming up with amazing consumer propositions, both the products themselves, but also the proposition and how something comes to life and really, really connects with the consumer, not just on the product level, but on a deeper emotional level. Well, now I've seen pictures of the Life Water product already. And one of the things that I kind of took away was the artistry of the packaging itself. It's almost like you're putting a work of art in people's hands. I don't know if that was part of the part of the part of the strategy. It's it's a it's a beautifully designed product. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No, you literally just nailed it. This is a brand that fuses creativity and design to serve as an inspiration, as well as the hy hydration element of it, right? And the label, right. to your point, this is one of the most powerful equities of the brand. And it is a platform for emerging and developing artists to be seen by the broader world. And if you think about today's world, where things are Instagrammable and Snapchatable, being able to provide artists that platform gives them the ability to scale their reach while at the same time giving us the ability to have a scale impact on a consumer base. So, no, we're really excited about the platform as a whole, but to your point, the label, the power of the label, this artwork on the label, what it's going to do for the brand, but also importantly for emerging artists, is special. And we think it's going to be part of what makes this brand connect in a, a deeper way with consumers and therefore be a sustainable platform into the future as we build out our hydration portfolio. So we talked about product portfolio transformation. I'm curious, marketing is changing as well. I know that's one of your priorities. And I've seen or heard about the use of VR, virtual reality, emojis, empire show integrations, and cola houses. So you guys, I mean, it's like all over the, all over the map. So tell me about you know, how you're thinking about marketing, tra marketing transformation or marketing changes. Yeah, you know, it, it all starts at, um, or starts with, we put the consumer at the center of everything we do. And I'll just share one thing that we, we think about when we think about consumers that really, really helps focus our thinking, shape our thinking, which is what we talk about as uh, latte. Local, authentic, transparent, traceable, and ethical. And this is what consumers expect, not just of PepsiCo, but of all brands in today's world. And if you start with the consumer and then you use that as a filter, it really informs everything that you do to authentically connect and engage with consumers. So things like the Cola House that you mentioned is this incredible experiential place where thought leaders can go experience our brands in a new way and then share it with their social networks where we know that they have incredible influence. So the old world, when you would do a local activation, the impact was in that local market. Today, if you do it right and if you're authentic about it, the scale, the impact of what you do locally can be felt much broader because of how consumers are sharing across platforms. You know, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Empire also. And if you think about um, what I said around Latte and, and being, you know, really, real authentic to your brand, pure product placement doesn't work the way it used to. And what was beautiful about uh, the Empire story is that we were incredibly authentic to Empire and we were incredibly authentic to our brand. PepsiCo has been a brand, or sorry, Pepsi has been a brand that over time has turned music stars into icons. And the storyline of Empire was all about an artist, Jamal, who was on the precipice of being an icon. And all he wanted to do was land a Pepsi spot because that would kind of signal that he's arrived. Think about the power of that. All of a sudden you're using something that's incredibly in culture, empire, huge digital footprint. And you're telling an authentic story to the platform empire and to the brand Pepsi, and you're doing it in a way that connects with consumers in a very, very legitimate way. You know, all the way to the point that in the third episode of, we had a three episode storyline integration, literally the, 
the storyline in the show was about, we're about to watch Jamal's new spot. It then cut to commercial time. We had the whole pod where we <laughs> ran a spot that was actually directed by one of the show creators. The spot then ran. It then cut back to the show where Jamal and his family were celebrating this incredible spot. So you think about the power of that. And it's, wow. um, it's connecting with your consumer in a way that you can't do when you speak at them versus speaking with them. And then the other thing you mentioned was, was Pepsi Moji. Um, mm -hmm. We all know that uh, we live in a mobile, a mobile first world and mobility has to be a consideration. And everything we do today is about short consumer attention spans and how we connect and engage in mobile. And this, this platform was built for that. That said, traditional media platforms are still incredibly important. It's just how you use them has to change. So TV was a huge bet for our Pepsi Emoji platform. But we fundamentally reinvented how I think the industry might use television. So instead of running a 30 second spot or a 15 second spot, we built over 105 second um, Pepsi Emoji spots and this ran in incredibly contextually relevant ways. So an award show five second spot would run during award shows. A sports five second spot would run during sporting events. And they were in these five second nuggets. So even in a multitasking world where consumers probably watching TV while on at least one device, sometimes two devices, maybe even three devices, this was a way to connect and, and engage with consumers in a really um, quick way that paid attention to their short attention spans, but also in a contextually relevant way so that you connect in a deeper way. So again, if you go back to your original question, Cola House, Pepsi Moji, Empire Integration may all feel like very, very different things to your point, but they're actually all about starting with where the consumer is, where they're going on their journey, and then being sensitive to that and designing your platforms to engage with them in this, in this new and exciting world. So you go from new uses of marketing back to what I call the epic experience, which is the Super Bowl halftime <laughs> show. Um, yeah. And Pepsi just owns that, right? You guys, that's your, your time. And this year you've got Lady Gaga, which is going to be epic in itself. And I honestly don't know who else could have followed Coldplay, Bruno Mars, and Beyonce all as one show other than Lady Gaga. <laughs> but how does, I mean, the planning for this must take a tremendous amount of time. And I'm just curious if you could give us a little insight into how, how this all takes place. I mean, do you start as soon as it's over <laughs> for the next year? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, make no mistake. The Super Bowl is our biggest marketing platform of the year. And for us, it isn't just about one day, but it's about, you know, a culmination of months of buildup that's been happening all season long with an amazing partner in the NFL, right? So it's about how our food and beverage brands come to life in store, which for months we activate at the moment of choice to engage our consumers in store and to drive purchase. It's how our brands come to life online in digital ways leading up to the Super Bowl to engage our fans. And then to your point, it's also about the day of. And we are so, so excited for Super Bowl 51, for Lady Gaga to take the stage, and for us, the power of this platform is, is changing the model from a 30-second spot where you're engaging consumers in a very legitimate way, and it's still one of the only days in the year where you can count on consumers engaging in an entire 30-second spot, but it shifts that, and it becomes a 12-and-a-half-minute platform for our brand to shine at the absolute center of sports and music pop culture, where Pepsi really is at its best. And not only that, but we're really, really excited for this year's because we are prioritizing Pepsi Zero Sugar, which is leaning into the fact that consumer tastes are evolving and that no calorie, low calorie beverages are becoming a more and more important part of consumers' repertoire. So, you know, we're really, really excited about that. And then other things that we're doing around Super Bowl are also prioritizing another new brand, Life Water, which we talked about before. We'll have significant on-site presence around Life Water, really helping launch that brand uh, in a powerful way and in a sustainable way that'll make sure that this platform becomes a huge por portion of our portfolio going forward. So, you know, we love our partnership with the NFL. We love the platform of Super Bowl. We love making it months of activity rather than a single 
day, and we love connecting and engaging consumers on that day in a way that we think is special for us that no other company is doing in quite as powerful way as we are. Now, I have a quick question about the Pepsi Zero Sugar yeah. and the name itself. As a brand guy myself, I have to think, one, okay, it's completely like on the surface tells you what it is. But at the other sense, I'm wondering if you had to go there to build trust with consumers with other types of issues in the marketplace. But I, I don't know. I mean, it, it just seemed so right there in your face that it, obviously it has zero sugar, but you had to say that as the name of the product wow. itself. Yeah. And, and what I would say is while we talk about that as the name from a consumer perspective, over the course of the next one to two years, I fundamentally believe that they will consider this to be Pepsi Black and that it will become part of the platform rather than the technical thing of what it is. That said, there is still a huge portion of consumers that in cola, both for our brand and other brands in the marketplace, that is this kind of black can business, there's a huge portion of consumers that don't know that that has zero sugar and zero calories. So there is a bit of this that is education right. as consumers are confused about what is or isn't in products. So while that is the name that it appears on can, it'll be in all the assets, and it helps educate consumers around what is or isn't in it, I think over time consumers will really connect with this as they would a you know American Express, Express black card, that this becomes the kind of black can variant of Pepsi that just happens to have zero sugar. No, I, I mean, I like the educational component to it. It's just, you know, as marketers, sometimes we get a little tied up in our own uh, naming <laughs> exercises. I, I just like the, it is what it is at the moment. Yeah. So it's nice and easy to understand. So you've talked a lot about how talent is key to making all these transformations happen. How are you thinking about talent both inside your organization as well as the partners that you choose to work with. Yeah, I, you know, I'm both incredibly passionate about it and incredibly focused on it because I truly believe that uh, if you're not spending enough time thinking about how to build capability, how to build a diverse team made up of, you know, folks that are not just part of, you know, it's not just the visible diversity, but also diversity of skill sets, diversity of style, diversity of background. If you're not doing that, you're not building a team and a culture that can succeed in today's fastly changing world where you have to be incredibly agile. So I believe that investing in talent builds business success, that investing in creating the right culture of the teams internally and to your point externally with our agencies will ultimately build business success. So Anything from, you know, and I mentioned this before, creating a culture where folks are more comfortable taking risk and, you know, it, it's okay if there's a failure as long as you fail fast and learn from it. So things like PepsiCo Fast Pitch, which is a, a project that we did where um, anyone in the department could come up with any idea and they pitched it to a panel of us. And in a single day, we gave out a million dollars based upon the ideas that we liked for the teams to go deploy into the marketplace, those ideas within a very, very short time period, that helps build this culture of experimentation and it helps focus on talent. So from that to how we even structure our teams, our core brand groups are broken into three distinct groups. One is innovation and strategy, which is focused on the long-term view. Another is communications, which is focused on the platforms that, you know, move consumer passion and connect and engage our consumers at that moment to the third plank is this commercial team. We call it commercial, which is about connecting and engaging with our consumers at the moment of choice in store. If you think about that structure, it not only enables the business success, but it builds talent because you can then move your talent through the organization and someone can go do you know, an assignment on an innovation strategy team and learn. They can then move to a commercial team and learn something fundamentally different and then go to a comms team and learn areas of consumer passion and insight that they didn't touch in those other two areas. So that's how we structure our core brand groups. We also, as I think you might know, have a, a PepsiCo creator group, right? 
which is a, it's, it's really a catalyst group within the team whose mission is to explore the edges of culture and co-create innovative experiences by exploring the fringes. Think about that from a talent perspective. We can become a talent magnet because we're doing something like that, where if we weren't, I think it would probably be harder to compete for talent against some of the places that we're competing for talent today. And today we're not just competing for talent with other CPG companies, right? But we're competing for talent, tech companies, startups, and all that. So having some of this stuff go on inside of this huge business, here's why it's special. We have some of the magic that an employee can get at a startup or at a tech company, but we're doing it with some of the biggest scale and some of the most significant resource in industry. So it en enables us to, to really, really attract talent that we wouldn't be able to attract otherwise. So thinking about talent, not just in how you want to leverage talent to build your business, but how you want to leverage talent to become a magnet for other talent, how you want to leverage talent to give people new experiences, it is ultimately what will differentiate us from others in the marketplace and what will make our success, I think, sustainable over time. And by the way, it's also the right thing to do. When you authentically prioritize people, everything else follows, full stop. I love that. One follow-up on that area is as you think about developing and attracting uh, being a talent magnet, you know, are you consciously making decisions about what do I bring in-house versus leave outside to partners? No, no question. And I actually think that that's a fluid dialogue that is very, very healthy to have ongoing both internally and with our partners. So things like uh, our content studio, which is a global content studio that PepsiCo launched, we are now insourcing some content like Instagram on Pepsi. There are other things that we continue to outsource, but we do it in new ways where we have more of an open source agency model. We're still using our big strategic agencies on some of our work, but then we're sourcing creative from emerging artists. We're sourcing creative from screenwriters. We're sourcing creative from poets who understand culture and help us connect and engage with consumers. So we are striking, I think, a great balance of insourcing versus you know, outsourcing, but we continue to have that evolve over time. And I think it, if you're not evolving it and if you're not continuing to talk both internally and with your strategic partners and new partners about it, you might miss something. And I think we'll get a ton right and I think we'll get some of it wrong. That's why we have to be agile with our teams internally and with our external partners to make sure that we are this kind of evolving collective team that absolutely does the best job of connecting and engaging consumers in a latte way. And with that, I, I believe that you know our businesses will be successful, our partners will be successful, and our talent internally will be successful. So it's a really, really, really important thing to think about what you just asked, that balance between internal and external. And I actually think there's not a right answer or a wrong answer, but rather an evolving answer that in the industry, we have to continue to evolve to stay current and to make sure that we're successful. So now stepping back from the business and marketing for that matter, I want to talk about you for a few minutes. Sure. You know, you've achieved great success already. I see nothing but greater success going forward. But I'm curious what drives you? What makes you get up every day to go after it? Uh -huh. It's really two big things. The first one won't shock you at all, given what we've been talking about. But the first one without question is the people agenda. And I get up every morning excited to have a positive impact on people. And if I can do that, at pockets during my day, if I can do that before hours, after hours, that absolutely fuels me and it keeps me motivated um, and it keeps me engaged in a way that uh, I get so much out of my job because of that. And then the other thing that, that fuels me is a significant challenge where transformation and change is a necessity in order to overcome that challenge. Personally, I'm actually a, an avid cyclist. It's part of who I am. You know, I'm a huge family guy. 
I have an amazing wife and three beautiful daughters, and they fuel my energy for the people. They fuel my energy for my pers- personal passion in cycling, and they fuel my passion for just being a, a, a present person. But if you think about cycling for a second, you know, I, my focus, I'm a road cyclist, and I'm not happier than when I'm in Europe climbing the biggest mountains, the Alps, the Pyrenees, the Dolomites. And if you think about the mindset to do that, if you think about, you know, you're climbing up a mountain for sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours, sometimes two and a half hours without a break, without a flat or a downhill. If you think about that challenge, how hard it is, the training, the preparedness to, to be able to accomplish that, that fuels me. And there is absolutely an analog for um, what keeps me motivated at work, which is a really, really significant challenge that takes planning, takes commitment, that takes focus, and that while you're in it, there's a lot of moments that you say to yourself, am I going to be able to do this? Are we going to be able to get there? (laughs) And without question, almost every big climb that I do in Europe, there's a point in the climb where I'm like, I can't believe I am putting myself through this. I'm never going to do this again. And then I get to the top and I'm like, I can't wait to climb the next one. (laughs) And that is, that's exactly how I think about work, right? Which is when you're in it, you sometimes think, can we do this? Can the team accomplish this? And it's staying focused on that you can and that when you get to the top with the team, with whatever that objective is, it's so invigorating that that's what keeps you motivated during it. And that's what in my mind, helps, you know, helps keep me fueled and it helps me as I engage with the people in the department to keep them motivated and fueled and inspired to accomplish goals that to a lot of people would seem impossible. Right. Well, I I think that's a beautiful analogy. I mean, there's something psychological to that, right? That you, you, you break down your human psyche to the point of, you know, how am I going to propel myself, literally (laughs) propel myself over this hill? And then you do it, and it must just be a sense of accomplishment that leads to the next one, right? Indeed, um, it sure yeah, is. Yeah, pain so. and accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it takes a few weeks to recover, but uh, <laughs> especially as we as we age. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, moving on, what brands or companies or even causes do you think others should be taking notice of? And I know you know you're in a brand, many brands, in your day job, but I, I find myself and, and most marketers out there are students of what's going on around us as well. Yeah, so I could give you a few examples. Let me start with a a partner of ours um, in the NBA. Um, I am so impressed with what the NBA as a brand is doing, and it's because of how agile they are. And this starts at the commissioner, and it goes all the way down through the entire organization. But the NBA is experimenting in digital, I think, in a way that is instructive to others and can be illustrative to how to take risk, deploy technologies, and connect and engage consumers, whether it's their presence on Snapchat that not just the league has, but the team has, and they allow their players to have. Whether it's every single week there's a full game that's in VR. Whether it is their mobile streaming has a different view. In every one of their facilities, they put in a different camera that has a more uh, a close-up view of the action so that consumers watching on a mobile device can see it better than if they were watching it on a 70-inch television. So the NBA is one brand that inspires me that way, but it also inspires me because they've let their game evolve as consumer tastes and players have evolved. So there's much more influence from Europe in the game now. And that's hard because the the league could have taken a position of, no, the game should be played the way it used to be played, but they didn't. They evolve over time. So the NBA is one. Tesla is another I am a big fan of big, hairy, audacious goals. I actually give an award out on my team. It's, you know, I give out a bunch of awards every year that reinforce the things that are important to me. One of them is called the We Choose to Go to the Moon Award. And if you think about JFK's We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, he put a vision out there that was a big, hairy, audacious goal that no one knew how we were going to accomplish it. But he set the vision because it was important at the time And because he wanted to align people and resources against that vision. And guess what? We figured out how to make it happen and we accomplished that goal. If you think about what Elon Musk is doing and what Tesla is doing, it's not about what they're deploying today. 
he sees a future that is completely different than what exists today. And because of that, they might miss earnings. They might miss expectations on production. But because he sees the future, because he knows the technology that is going to be self-driving cars that don't require traditional fuel, consumers, investors, other stakeholders believe in that and therefore are willing to be along the journey when there are both the upsides and, frankly, the bumps in the road. So that's another one that if you think about the advocacy of a consumer that owns a Tesla, I mean, they are so passionate that they are constantly convincing others to go engage with this brand. So, so that's another one. And then the third I'll give you is, uh, is, is a brand that's been going through some struggles right now, and it's because of how they handled that that, that I'm impressed with them, which is Samsung. And, you know, it would be easy to take a, uh, a PR crisis and to get too hung up on that and to stop driving innovation and to stop pushing positive brand image forward. But they haven't done that. And they have uh, they've turned what, what could have been derailing into, you know, let's keep going. Let's keep pushing. Let's learn from our mistakes. And I am so moved by a traditional piece of content in the marketplace right now. It's a 30 second spot that they've done around Galaxy, um, which is a VR spot. And what it does that I don't think yes. any other VR yet, so you've seen Yes, it, right? yes, yep. What nothing, no other piece of content that I've seen does is bring out the emotion of VR. So these are different age groups, different ethnicities, different groups of people sitting around while one person is in the experience. Mm -hmm. And there's tears and there's laughter and there's surprise, and there's delight. And they've taken tech, and they've put their brand at the center of the emotion of that tech. And I think because of that, it's connecting with consumers in a way that a lot of other virtual reality stuff hasn't, because it's still at an arm's length, and it's still a little bit more tech versus emotion. So that's the third one that I'm really, really impressed with what they're doing and think that others should take notice of. No, that's a great example. So last question, uh, yeah. to get out your crystal ball, what do you predict for the future of marketing? Huh. So I think for all of us, right, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and, you know, getting hopefully half of it right and the half that we get wrong, being able to quickly adjust so that we could capitalize on whatever the new trends are that we, we didn't experience. So, um, or sorry, that we didn't expect. But there's, you know, there's probably three that I'm thinking a lot about for the future and what they mean for our business, you know, as we get into to 2017. One is certainly native advertising. And, you know, even using the word advertising feels awkward and weird when you talk about being native. Because to me, this is about adding value to a consumer experience rather than detracting or interrupting a consumer experience. So I just think the the, the better that we can get as an industry in connecting and engaging with consumers in a legitimate and authentic way that really enhances that moment, that respects what that consumer wants and doesn't want, and then provides something to them that is valuable at that time. So being incredibly native in the right ways allows us to do that. So that's number one. Number two is certainly experiential marketing. If you go back to being local, authentic, transparent, traceable, and ethical, so much of that can happen in an experience that you build, like what we're doing at Cola House, like another initiative we're doing with something called Fizz, which is reimagining bubbles. And the power of doing experiential marketing the right way today is what I mentioned before, that in a world of things being Instagrammable, Snapchatable, you can scale an experience in a single market and have an impact on a huge broad base of consumers because of how consumers that experience it are then talking about your brand. So that's another one. And then uh, the third that I'll mention is kind of what I like to think about is the blurring of fiction and reality. And this is a world that we're already seeing a lot more of and that I think we'll continue to see more of in the future. So I'll just give you a couple couple of examples outside of, of Pepsi and then go back to one inside of Pepsi. A couple of outside of Pepsi, if you think about how Netflix had done some of their promotion around House of Cards, there was literally an online digital campaign for Frank Underwood for president. <laughs> Not a campaign for the show, right? Yeah. Yeah. But a digital campaign about 
this character <laughs> for president. <laughs> that is blurring fiction and reality. Another really, really cool one is something that uh, that Paramount did when uh, when they were promoting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is they built a ninja lair on Airbnb that consumers <laughs> could go see online, experience, etc. Like incredibly fascinating way to promote <laughs> your brand, or or in that that case, the movie in in a world that blends kind of fiction and reality. And our example, of course, I talked about it before, is Empire. Pepsi is this brand in culture that consumers know takes music stars and makes them icons. So we went into a fictitious world and we did that and we did it in an authentic way. So I think we're going to see, you know, as brands, as marketers, as professionals, as leaders who are building talent, I think we're going to see more and more this trend of blending fiction and reality. And it's up to us to make sure that our teams are focused on it, thinking about it. And look out at the future and uh, and kind of think about other ways that they can do that. So those, you know, native advertising, experiential marketing, and then this this fascinating blending of fiction and reality are just some of the things that I think we could uh, we could expect in the future. I think that's great. I mean, when my when my candidate Frank Underwood doesn't win the election, I can go hide <laughs> in a turtle cave and <laughs> and be excited by the fact of Pepsi bringing a new generation to music. I, wow, you did that well. That was I awesome. know, right? <laughs> so you just created my new reality. So uh, so, but Seth, no, it's in serious in serious thoughts. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely, I really really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me.